What's up everyone? I'm Nathan Graham Davis and I'm going to re-break in as a Hollywood screenwriter. So it's week 12 and Malcolm Spellman is back and frankly I think he outdid himself this time. The insights that he shared in this one are just, uh, well, you will see. As usual, it was just kind of a conversation that really challenged me and pushed me outside my comfort zone and that has honestly been the real reward for doing this series is just, you know, I can tell that I'm becoming a better writer as a result of these conversations. Before we get into it, you'd be doing me a huge favor if you click subscribe and if you're getting any value out of these, please share an episode with a friend or, uh, you know, lots of friends. My goal is to do a live streamed reading of the finished polished script. And I can't do that unless I've got 1000 subscribers. So thank you so much for your help in making that happen. And with that, here we go. What's up? Yeah. How you doing, man? Good, man. You know, um, what's going on with you? I, you know, I got to tell you the truth, bro. I, what are we doing today? I was surprised. Talking. Once you started emailing me, I was like, Tammy, what's going on here? Because <laughs> my yeah, shit be hard, Nate. You my, told I'm me like, to schedule something, so I did. <laughs> like, I'm back. <laughs> um, how you been? What's been going on with the project? First, like, what's going on with the Shit's podcast? Good, dude. What's going on with the script? Um, all right, so re-entry is going pretty well. Uh, this You are episode 12, so, uh, you know, it's actually growing and doing something now um and uh i'm 70 pages into the first draft of the script so that's pretty cool um and it's a script that i wouldn't be writing if it hadn't been for the first one of these that we did so also like, pretty cool if, i mean so, i hope i hope you do something with it so i don't get blamed but um right no that that's the uh that's the caveat there so how you, how you feeling about the script so far i mean i know it's a rough draft yeah no i'm feeling good about it um it's a lot of fun to write. It's super challenging. Um, I don't know how much of these you've managed to catch with how busy you've been. Um, like four of them or something like that, maybe five. Oh, uh, all right. So um, you see me comment on the ones. I just picked random ones. And then the yeah. one dude I'm jealous of because he got more views than me. What's his name? Who's that? Oh, I oh, know. Jeff Willis? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but he was number one. So he had a head start by like three weeks. Well, we got to tell all, all your 103 viewers to uh, go out i'm up to like 260 now malk it's getting serious so ties your shit as soon as you get to ten thousand. yeah no dude um so so what i'm writing is the sorcerer's apprentice meets the witch by way of whiplash basically this young woman in uh medieval norway tracks down a witch living in the middle of the woods and convinces her to become her apprentice and then uh the which turns out to be this awful mistress whiplash type thing. And uh, it just all goes to shit. Anyway, dude, it's going I well. Love whiplash. Um, I, I'm trying, I'm trying to like it. Cause that's what stuck out to me as soon as you said that. Right. And whiplash is the movie is first and foremost about that dynamic between the two of them. Right. Yeah. That's, that's what the movie is. Right. That's why it's great. And it's compelling. Cause you have an older dude and a younger dude. So that's always a natural thing or whatever right i can't remember in whiplash what was the young dude's reason what did he want so much that he was so he wanted to be a that. drummer more than anything right and so right. That, so that for, tense for her it's she wants to learn magic more than anything right and so and actually that kind of in the first act the the witch kind of says no i'm not going to train you um because she doesn't buy her reason it doesn't come across as authentic. Uh, and then she comes back at the end of act one and kind of convinces her. And all she says is like, I want something that's my own, which is true for her, but it has more, more meaning. It is the intense want of the younger person, right? Oh, totally. That, lead, that leads them into a cauldron. And what's happening in this training for the witchcraft leaves this person fundamentally transformed. Yes. Right? Uh, yeah great. yes yeah and and so that's what you that's the path that you led me down right because yeah yeah totally because so i had you know pitched you a couple ideas that were i i still think they're good ideas as far as just being you know ideas for their movies right like you can see the movie 
Um, but you had said, Nate, you're not passionate about these and it's just not going to work as well because of that. And so I went back to the drawing board after I'd already come up with like 55 ideas. And I just jotted down my favorite movies from the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. And so many of them, you know, along the lines of Whiplash, just had a character that was pursuing an obsession relentlessly yeah. at any cost, no matter what they had to sacrifice, um, no matter whether it was the right thing to do or not. And, you know, that just seems to be a, a recurring theme in a lot of my favorite movies and also in a lot of the stories that I've written. And so I just started trying to come up with movie ideas that embodied that. And I came up with probably 10 or 15 and then eventually landed on this. Hold on, this motherfucker is blowing. See, this is good. You're low outside. It's a leaf blow outside. Your interviews are way more interesting because there's movement in them. So it's good. I got, uh, I'm, I'm trying to stop doing that shit. I got, uh, yell that because normally I pace but anyway yeah it's uh you want your character and your story to have revelations about herself and about the world and how she's going to approach the world after she's done training totally. um, so what are we talking about today on this zoom so what we want to get into today is like the second half of act two so that's where I'm at right now right um and I thought it'd be really cool to just kind of dig into that, um, get your insights, maybe discoveries that you've made along the way in your own journey. Um, by the way, speaking of your journey, so I, one quick question I have for you. Uh, so you sent me uh, a script yesterday, which we can't get into the details of, uh, we can't. but um, you had mentioned that it was a better indication of who you are as a writer now. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, I, so I think that's an interesting thing to say, because like from my perspective, I mean, you've always been a great writer, right? So, like, what does that mean uh, to you? Like, like, ha, ha, does that mean growth or just change? Like, for me, there was it's a, it's a combination of things, right? Um, 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 I, I, I feel like I've grown a lot, and part of it is a lot of it is confidence. And I always thought I was a confident writer, right? Okay. But as I use fewer words and try less hard to convey a thought or create a mood or unpack a scene, I realized that I wasn't, you know what I'm saying? I'm work I was working too hard at manifesting my intention. So number one is confidence and the confidence to get to it and know I've gotten it, you know what I'm saying? And so this is going to sound like, oh, what he's saying is don't overwrite. And that's not what I'm saying. I had to overwrite when I was less confident because I had to write until I knew I delivered the mood or the uh, tone or the description or played out the action to a degree that I thought my intentions, what I wanted the audience to feel or understand or what I wanted the progression to be um um i had to write more words to get that done and it's funny i remember arguing with this kid man uh we was on one of them pages like it might have been dundeal pro or might have been inside pitch on facebook or whatever right but i was hella frustrated i was talking to this writer who was telling me that david kelly wasn't a good writer right because his shit was he gets to it right and i'm like Man, you you know, I got so frustrated. I was a little bit rough with him. I hope you don't see this. But uh, 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 he was saying, he was telling me this script he loved. Um, I can't remember what it was, but it was a cheesy movie, right? And he was sending me passages and they were super purple and flowery. And then he was sending me David Kelly passages, right? And I'm like, bruh, that's, that's the sign of mastery, right? What you think is boring is because you're in the hands of a master who can cut through his own shit and get to what is necessary to construct a good fucking scene. Anyway, so on this, the last thing you read of mine, I just, I feel like I just, probably every two or three scripts I write, I'm embarrassed by everything I wrote before it. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, totally. And, 
And this one was one where I just, you know, I just felt dialed in. I felt like I was on it. I just felt like I was getting, I was, again, I think the main advanced thing that you see, like from the old script gun down to this one is the confidence to believe, to get to the point. And I did know I'd gotten it right on this particular draft, on this particular script. That's, that's a great feeling, dude. Um, you know, I mean, it definitely didn't pull any punches at all. Um, and like, I assume that's part of what you're talking about in terms of confidence, right? Like, I mean, you were just willing to kind of go there um, regardless of whether it was, you know, a certain element or a certain emotion or whatever. Um, and I, I can't speak to specifics, obviously, but yeah, it's no, pretty cool. But, but yeah, I, I definitely, I felt free. It's something I try and do like in, I think the draft that you got a gun down, there's a, a scene I had to change because people were uncomfortable with it. And I'm fine with that, right? If I get a same note from a lot of people, I'm gonna take it very seriously, right? And it was a scene where in a nutshell, a psychopath is about to murder a little girl and he's explaining to the girl's father what he's gonna do to her, right? With a gun, nothing, you know what I'm saying? And and I wasn't, and then he does it, right? And I wasn't doing that, I wasn't trying to be bold or crazy or whatever, right? Um, I try to be honest. I try to let the people say what I think they would say, feel what I think they would feel and do what I think they would do, right? And I feel like the more free and honest I am when I'm writing, the more I get responses back from people who are like, and it can be a nice thing. It can be, it can be, I remember I wrote this thing where it was this, oh, it don't matter. It, it can be, it, do, it doesn't always mean edgy or whatever, but I hear people respond to the edgy stuff like, oh, fuck, you know, you were just like, fuck it, I'm going to go crazy. It's like, no, 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 I'm trying to let this shit out and let the snowball of what's been happening in the story through these characters come out naturally. And yeah, that sometimes occurs. It, it leads to some edgy shit sometimes, but it can lead to really nice shit too that surprises you. Yeah, I feel like what you're talking about, a lot of it is just instinct almost that you've developed. It, it, you know, that's, and that all comes from confidence. Your instincts are going to like, I'd say a substantial portion of writers, including myself, have to turn off that thing that's worried about page count. Mm. Something should have happened by now. At this page, you should be here. Oh, fuck, your pilot's gonna be 80 pages uh, long, right? That's so funny, because that's something I'm dealing with right now, and, for sure. Like, I'm on page yeah. 70 and I'm like, this is gonna be, I'm gonna have a really short third act. Like, and, it, and it you fucks know. up your writing, Nate. You start doing shit like this, right? Like, that extra line that seems unnecessary to get you out of a scene, like, okay, then I'll see you later, right? You don't write that line, right? Because you're like, fuck, this will drop my page count to this or that or whatever, right? And the accumulation of all the compromises you make from second guessing yourself in general, but in this case, second guessing yourself because of length of page count, right? Leads to you doing the minorest things that you will never, the compromises you make you will never be able to track them all because they're so fucking minor, but they fuck up the overall read. So when I'm saying confidence, confidence leads to like, you know, I won't mention like one of my, I got a dear friend, man, who's a big, big writer. And he's, his shit is funny. And he's like, ah, man, you know, script came in at a lean 187 pages. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, like he, he, he lets it be what it's going to be. And so yeah, that's that's confidence, dude. That that's like the the freedom comes from confidence. You know what I'm saying? The honesty cool. comes from confidence. It comes from just letting yourself believe that this is oh, and you said trusting your instincts. That comes from confidence, you know? That's awesome. Um, yeah, it's funny that you said that about the page count because it's definitely been messing with me. And I'm like, I'm trying not to worry about it too much, but have I been able to turn it off? No, definitely not. Like it's, it's, fuck, it's Nate. in there. Yeah, I would watch out for that because you you are making compromises if it's in your head. And 
it's I don't think there's no upside to it. Like to be able to play with a scene and know you're gonna find a scene and know you'll cut all the the first two pages of dialogue you're gonna you're gonna cut because you knew when you found it. As soon as she said, you know, fuck you, then I don't even want to be a witch, right? It took you two pages to get to that line, and then the scene came alive. And yeah, yeah, sure. when you go back through, you're gonna have to take this seven page or five page scene, cut the first two pages out, start it there, rework it a little bit, and it'll get down to two pages. And it'll be that scene that some kid is who's watching your podcast, one of the 112 people that watch right. your podcast, um, will read your script and be like, damn, he's so tight. I got to, it's going to fuck me up in my head with page count, not knowing that you wrote a seven page scene with the confidence to know I'm writing it to find it. I'm letting the characters play. I'm letting them come alive. Oh fuck. Now I'm in the groove. Now the scene is really being written. You know what I'm saying? And thinking about stuff like, like page count or structure or where shit's going to come, it, it clouds that. And I find it very damaging for myself. So, so when you are talking about like structure and page count stuff, I know that you outline, right? Like you definitely, yep. you outline. So you're thinking about structure on the outline stage to some point, right? Like right? to some, some degree, you're thinking about the structure of the script. It's all based on confidence. Did I say the thing that McCory said on Twitter a while back that I thought was fucking brilliant? I'm, I might fuck it up though. If, if, Just go if for I, it. So he said some version of all these rules and all this talk about process on structure is absolute bullshit, right? And he said, structure is what happens when, and forgive me, Chris, if I get this wrong. If you lay your characters and story and plot or whatever you things you use to diagnose and say are the components of a screenplay. Mm -hmm. If that shit is unfolding in the right way, structure is what happens, right? And a structural innovation that Tarantino or some European director, I remember wa watching one, I watched a Spanish movie, I think it was, or something like that, it was a love story. Basically the first act is 60 minutes and then there's a second act. Right. Sure. And and all of that seems like, oh, premeditated genius. Right. But it's just the confidence to know my shit's going to play out what happens anyway. So the idea that structure is a thing that happens if you if you're just writing the right way. Um, um, yes, I'm thinking about structure when I'm outlining, but only in the sense of. I'm hunting for flab. Um. I'm sharpening intention and in doing the kind of shit, like what is this thing achieving? What are, in making things better, inherently what happens is you start to know, well, fuck, this ain't gonna mean nothing. The the witch telling the other older witch to fuck off, I don't even wanna be a witch, isn't gonna mean nothing if this scene that happens three beats later where they both share camaraderie about their love of being witches doesn't happen before then, because then it's betraying, it's betraying that that pledge that they made together, right? And so, sure, that's happening structurally in outlines, but I, I work hard to forget all the shit I read in the books, and I remind myself, you know, again, this I don't know what shit I've told you and talk, told another young writer, but all those books on screenwriting were written using half of them use movies as examples that were written before screenwriting gurus existed. You know what I'm saying? And now they're saying, this is the formula they were, fo they were following, but it's like, motherfucker, that, didn't, that formula didn't exist. Your, your, exec, your producer would tell you, this shit is getting boring. You gotta have some action earlier, right? And I didn't give a fuck when she told him, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. So you gotta set that up. And in doing that, a bunch of shit will fall away and structure occurs. That's That's, a convoluted way to what uh, 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 that Macquarie tweet, tweet and I'm, um, uh, you know, I'm always nervous about mentioning people, but that that seems. No, like man, that's cool. So no, I appreciate you sharing that. It's like, I don't know. Um, I definitely don't. I don't dig way into plot points, but I definitely think about the midpoint in every single script for sure, um, and. It, 
you know, it's always something that takes things in a completely different direction, you know, and, uh, and, and it's a big twist. And usually kind of the script evolves out of that. Um, and I always know what the ending is and whatnot. But, you know, it's, uh, that is like one of the things that I wanted to dig into with you was like kind of that second half of the second act. And so, you know, maybe this is going to be a way more, I don't know, ethereal conversation or whatever. No, I can talk because, that. Like, so let me start with this. There is a cheat code for me anyway, when I'm writing, which is the hero's journey, right? And not mm -hmm. every, I don't believe in all that shit that every story is a hero's journey. Shit is what the fuck it is, right? But if you follow the obvious progression yeah. of any hero's journey story, right? Then you know what must happen in the second half of a, of a second act, right? Right. So you got your and, basic, like, you know, there's going to be a, the, the protagonist is going to go after things really hard after that midpoint and they're going to fail and there's going to be a low point. And then they're going to kind of like summon themselves together and, and go after it again. And there's your third act. Right. And um, usually it falls apart. Right. Right. After somewhere right. shortly after, like I, I, I'll go as far as if it's a job and the execs really want a hero's journey, you can do little charts of like the false arc, right? The hero in the first half of the second act has gone through enough events that they think they've arced, right? But that dragon that's internal that they, that they haven't slayed yet is still out there. So the hero is seemingly using the force or, so here's a mock pitch using a, a fake version of the matrix to make my point. You can have what's known as a false arc, right? So let's say the obvious thing we're tracking is if Neo doesn't learn to do all kinds of crazy karate shit and have superpowers, the world is fucked up, right? And you're following that. Will he or won't he become the hero that he needs to become at the end of this movie, right? And let's say he doubts himself for all kinds of reasons, right? If you embed a core issue, like let's say he's a misogynist, right? This is not the movie, but for the sake of this mock pitch. All, you're wondering if he's going to become that hero or not, right? And you're wondering if he's going to build up confidence, right? But there's still this one kernel of a, of a, of a trauma that's in him that until he un uncovers that, he won't truly reach it. The false arc is right around that midpoint. The hero is doing karate, is beating people up. You feel like this motherfucker really might be the hero, right? But he shows you, he does that one thing that's rooted in that trauma that's gonna come back in a few beats and unravel everything. Cause you know, in the second half of that second act of a hero's journey, sure. a sequence of events takes the hero to his lowest point, right? And so the false arc might be, I'm doing everything great. It looks like we're gonna win the day, but I don't want no women coming with me on this mission, right? Then, so everything's been going great. We're just getting past the uh, midpoint. The hero seems like he's about to overcome this great thing, but the story God says, well, here's the problem. Uh, uh, Neo, I'm going to take everything away from you, including your powers, because there's no women here. And you would, you know what I'm saying? You wouldn't have seen it coming. So, yeah, you have, you, oftentimes you'll have that false arc that leads to the hero having a false victory, which then leads to a sequence of events that tears the hero to bits. And a trick that uh, Derek has taught me, um, this ain't going to be rocket science, y'all, but again, any pieces of process that you learn seem like fucking gold when you hear them, right? He's like, when I get totally. stuck in the second act, I go to the bottom of the second act and I start listing all the shit. Did I say all this already on the last thing? No, no. Nope. I start listing all, I, st I, stay, I list all the shit at the end of act two that has to happen to break my hero down to his lowest point, right? So the, in this version of Matrix, he's lost the ability to do karate the bad guy has taken over the world. The woman he loves doesn't fuck with him because he's a misogynist and his whole crew has been disbanded, right? We, and I just, you know, I, this is not the real Matrix, sure. this is the fake Matrix. Well, with those four beats, you now know, well, fuck, what are the beats that make me care about each one of those, right? Well, if, if uh, 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 I want, if he's forgotten karate, right? I need to have, and you want to root it in emotion, right? 
I need to root it in, I need to have the moment that establishes the value of karate and karate might be fucking people up, but I need to root at least a couple of moments, if not one moment in an emotional victory. Like my karate allowed me to beat bad guys, but there's a valley of little kids that eat popsicles be, that are safe because of my karate. It's, it's rooted in emotion. This is a terrible metaphor, right? I'm, next I'm one, following you though. Just keep going. It's good. <laughs> the next one is, well, the bad guy has won, right? And so whatever kingdom houses all the power that people get karate from and rule the world with had always been in the hands of good people, right? And now the bad guy, the ISR and whatever is in the tower and darkness is spreading out, right? Oh, the crew is disbanded, right? Oh, and so you have to, you have to if, if that's gonna happen then, right? Whatever that tower is looking over, you have to put in beats that make you give a fuck about that world. Otherwise, who cares that that power is now in darkness? The crew has been disbanded, right? We, we listed that as one of the beats. Well, I need to show in a beat or two how this crew, crew fulfills this version of Neo in a way that was missing in his life, right? He was all alone, now he's got a family. I need to show how this crew with each other, valued each other, and now they're not going to even be friends anymore. With those two beats, now you give a fuck that the crew's gone, right? And then yeah. the last one is he lost a girl. That's easy. You have to have... So by, by going to the end and planting your flag on the things that would tear this hero apart, you immediately get those three or four beats require probably twice as many beats before them to make you give a fuck about them. And then all of a sudden you're like, God damn, you know what I'm saying? Most of my second act is now, you're not, not written, but I know what I got to hit to make that cool. bottom work. So working your way back in a, in a long winded way of saying, you pick all the things that need to happen at the lowest point, list them. Sometimes they happen in one scene. Sometimes they happen in a sequence of scenes, right? And then you have to do the things that anchor the downward spirals in emotion. You know what I'm saying? Bef like you have to set them up in a way that makes us invest in them emotionally. So that's how Derek thinks through stuff. Like, how do you think through it? Do you have any sort of process that you apply, you know, most times when you're sitting down to write a feature? Like well, I'm trying to get away from doing hero's journey stories because I got yep. bored with it. And, and, and it really is a cheat code. If you read the, uh, uh, anyone that's watching this thing, Vogler did a I read that one. The, yeah, did, but the, on. this, did, you, did you read the short document? Are you talking about this right here? Yeah, now there's a there's like a six or 12 page version of it. That was probably 10 years ago that I read that, but. Do you want the short version? I'll send it to you. The cliff there's, notes? It's like a six page document, right? And yeah. It's the only thing I've ever read that I think is valuable because he makes sure he lets you know you got to have these characters, like you got to have the Herald, you got to have the Guardian, you got to have a mentor, and you got to have a shapeshifter, right? But he also says you can combine these characters, right? A lot of times your shapeshifter is going to be the bad guy, right? In a Disney cartoon, the cute little black cat that walks away around morphs into an evil Sure. Queen, yep. right but the shapeshifter can be the hero or the shapeshifter can be the herald right you could combine these things you can play around with the elements once you understand them so that's that's the only thing i've ever read that i give a fuck about but as to how i go about it in a feature i'm trying to get away from hero journeys and probably half the fucking stories i write still if it's a feature end up falling under that because i'm it's a comfortable place for me to write from but I'm trying to be more uncomfortable now. So when I'm attacking a second act, I look at this. Number one is make sure, cause you, it feels like a barren wasteland sometimes, right? Nate, like you, you like you, and that act one is fucking hard and then boom, it's propulsive, right? Then you start getting into act two and you start going, fuck. This is a thing I see a lot. Different versions of the same scene, right? Like, yes. no, get rid of that shit. Yep. If, different, 
if it is not fundamentally different, you're not really being interesting. So in a non-hero's journey, you're really looking for different things for the second half of, of act two, right? Because you're free. In the second half of act two, it could become a different kind of movie. So when you get away from a, a, a traditional hero's journey in the back half of the the back half of the story, you might be spending more time with your villain. You might be like, fuck, I want people's heart to be broken when this villain dies. I'm about to do a whole 10 or 15 page sequence where we're in his point of view. And we're set, you know what I'm saying? Um, a lot becomes free when uh, uh, you abandon that hero's journey. And and I think that it's, 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 it's a crutch. It's not a bad thing because the shit works, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, it, it can be a crutch. No, I've written a lot of hero's journey stories. Uh, you know, I, I still enjoy them, but uh, it's not everything that I want to do for sure. So, but I think that this one feels a little bit like that. One challenge that I'm definitely having is I'm keeping it really contained. So, you know, there are only like five or six speaking roles in the whole movie. And a lot of it centers around just two characters isolated by themselves. And so, you know, there isn't a whole lot of opportunity for that shapeshifter and mentor and, you know, Harold and stuff like that. So trying to figure out how to uh, get the characters to play off of each other and whatnot has been challenging. I would say this, if you're going to do a contained thing, I actually was going to go the opposite way as, as you, it is one of the best things you can do to bring, to infuse a contained story with energy is more characters. And you have someone walk through the door who says, man, fuck all that shit. It's not going to be no more witches around here. Well, instantly now, your villain and your hero have to partner up because this person just walked through the door. You know what I'm saying? Because she can't achieve her goal of becoming a witch if this, if this character is correct. And this witch is a witch. So she, you know what I'm saying? And boom, you just bought yourself you took your story in a new direction, whatever, like uh, that, that's another thing. Like I do a lot. You'll, you'll see it in the script. I sent you the more recent one mm -hmm. that that's, I, I, you know, I was doing this thing at, uh, for AFF, um, with, uh, Austin film, for, yeah, with Austin film festival with, uh, Lindsay Duran. Right. And I was telling her about the scene that changed the way I write. Have I talked to you about Thunderbolt Lightfoot? No, man. So, I want to hear all about the scene that changed the way that you write. That so, sounds cool. I'm not the best at plot turns. Like I can figure, you know, I know when a basic plot turn needs to happen, but I'm never going to be able to do like usual suspects. You know what I'm saying? What I what Thunderbolt Lightfoot taught me is this scene where Clint Eastwood and Bridges have just narrowly escaped some shit. It's, you know, kind of a robbery heist movie, whatever, right? And they're in the middle of nowhere and they're hitchhiking to go home. And um, this is getting point A to point B, the simplest thing you can do, right? This car comes speeding, speeds right past them, right? Oh, fuck, he's not gonna stop. Slams on the brakes, hits a donut, comes back, nearly runs them over, right? And then they jump into the car, they open up the door, he's gonna pick them up, right? As soon as they open up the door, a raccoon hisses. And they're like, what the fuck? He's got a raccoon here. And the guy's like, uh, get on. So you now know you're, you're in a different place, right? They jump into the car. The car peels out, starts swerving around. They realize this dude is pumping his own uh, exhaust into the car, right? I, I, I assume it's to be high, but maybe he's trying to kill himself. Who knows? But you're like, fuck, what are we going to do? The car spins out, goes off the road, tumbles or whatever, right? The dude gets out the car, right, that they were hitchhiking with, with a shotgun. And Clint Eastwood and Bridget like this. He walks right past them, opens up the trunk, and it's filled with rabbits. And then he starts shooting at the rabbits, right? And eventually they knock him out and take his car. That disrupting storytelling. So you can disrupt storytelling in a lot of ways, right? The first way that I did a shitty job of trying to describe it is you disrupt the plot with plot, right? What that movie taught me is anyone who walks through the door can infuse a story 
with, the, with whatever energy and disruption you need, as long as they feel like they were honestly generated by the world you've created for your show or for your movie, right? And that fundamentally changed the way I write. So now when I get in tough spots like where you're at, I go like this, who could walk through the door to take these characters in a compelling direction or to make things interesting or to make shit funny or to make shit sad or to make shit scary, right? That's cool. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think that's a really good point. You know, it was just being able to use other characters to do something and yeah, I mean, it's um, the way that I've set myself up is you know, my, my protagonist has been search, searched for this woman for, you know, a couple months before she found her. I mean, she's really isolated and hidden, right? And so bringing another character into there early on would be really challenging the way that I've set it up. Um, and that's okay. Like, I've got, I've got other things that are working and I figured it out. And, uh, you know, there's this raven that the witch keeps that, uh, you know, there's a little more going on with it. And so there's kind of a third character there. But it, it has been challenging to try and figure that out for sure. Well, you know this, if it's at all feeling flat, the there's only one rule to screenwriting. Ted Ted Elliott told it on uh, in an argument, probably, it was probably on that message board, writer action. I don't know if that's still around. No, I never and, was on that one. And he was like, there's only one rule to screenwriting and that's be interesting. Sure, and that's yeah, the, I agree the, with that completely. And that's the same, and that shit sounds glib, but it ain't. That's the same thing pretty much McCoy was saying, or I was talking about earlier about plot, I mean, about structure, right? If you're being interesting, structure, well, it's gonna happen. It's because your instinct to be interesting is gonna force you to make choices where when the whole thing is done, someone's gonna look at this script and be like, man, the structure is fucking amazing because it was interesting every time sure. it needed to be interesting. So, you know, you do, you do owe it to your readers to be honest and to be interesting. And for me, one of the best cheats I got is that third character that walks through a door. And I do it a lot. Yeah, that's cool. So I don't know what that would look like, but it's something that I need to think about because I already know that I need to go back and play with the... Uh, the first half of act two for sure and then the second half is honestly right now it's feeling relatively strong but i think i mentioned to you that i'm concerned about the the way i've set myself up for the third act and the ending i don't know if i've got enough in there for it to pay off the right way with these two characters what do you think makes it as compelling as uh the drummer movie oh well, that's a good question so um, it's a similar relationship for sure, but the difference there is that there is a, a an estranged family connection, right? So um, I set it at exactly the time when Christianity started taking over Norway, um, witches had just started to be persecuted and whatnot, right? Um, but there were still plenty of people that kind of were in between. And so she had doubled down on, you know, wanting to stick with the old ways. Um, and her daughter had gone off uh, to follow Christianity and, you know, became a good, you know, Catholic. And, and so they became completely estranged as a result of that. Her daughter had a daughter. That's our protagonist. And so our protagonist was orphaned and decided upon coming to age that she wanted to actually track down her grandmother and, you know, become a witch. And uh, this woman has been living on her own for a very long time, hasn't really wanted anybody else in her life, um, but kind of sees this opportunity to potentially have this relationship, but pushes her really, really, really hard um, and to make sure that she really wants it. What, 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 what the urgency comes from, like the urgency that, uh, that drummer movie, right, comes from the immediacy of who those characters are and how they bring that to bear in every fucking moment, right? Mm. As soon as this the kid wants it so fucking bad, right? That right. at every yeah. moment I'm he's stepping in with I want it now. I want I, and I won't back up until I get it, right? And the older dude, the 
the dance of is this about testing him and is this about cruelty, right? And what do, do they ever get out? Like, what do they unpack the older dude? Uh, like who yeah. he is, why he's so fucked up? Yeah, they up? do, and it's and I think they did it in a really wonderful way. Yeah, um, where uh, you know, there's this line at, toward the end where you know, Fletcher, the older guy, says, "The I'm gonna get it wrong, but the most harmful two words in the English language are good job, right?" And his whole point was to try and. He wanted to break a Charlie Parker, right? He wanted to find a musician uh, that had this insane drive within them and inspire them and break them and get them angry enough to become who they could truly be and, and to become great. And he wanted, Fletcher wanted to create that, right? Or, um, and so- but Let me ask this. Okay, keep going, keep going. So no, I, I think that that was really cool. And- but did the you know, old so, Fletcher is the older dude, right? Right, right. So yeah. what was Fletcher's deal though? Why was he a teacher and not a player? And 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 like, do you remember anything about him as a character? Like why he was like this and why he was so fucked up and cruel? Because he wasn't nice to anybody. Oh, right? You mean like what brought him there? So I mean he said there were it, it was very, very brief when they covered that, but he just basically I, kind of alluded to the fact that he wasn't good enough to be the next Charlie Parker, but boom. he wanted to create the next Charlie Parker. Yeah, but boom, so. right with that, right? Immediately, it's all embedded in a trauma. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. And to me, that's one of the best places to look for to get that feeling of between, you know, between characters is if each one of them is basically a tree that's roots it can blossom whatever kind of flower shit you want, but underneath that soil is trauma, right? And until that trauma is put to bed, put to bed, it ain't gonna be right. No matter how close it get to get gets to right, it's not gonna be right. And because it can't just be right, no one is that fucked up and cruel just because they want you to be great. You know what I'm saying? Because he destroyed a lot of drummers, right? Sure. Yeah. A big no, part somebody of killed course. themselves probably because of him, right? So. Right. Exactly. And a big part of that is what a theory that a lot of people have about Hitler, right? Which is why I evaded everyone is because he was a failed artist, right? Right. And the trauma that comes from that and that he is taking that out on his students and has simultaneously rationalized that I'm doing it because I want to make someone great. Do you feel like that old man was just a benign guy or do you feel like he was a fucked up person but also knew this kid could be great? That, uh, the latter, for sure. And so, so where, where does it end with the old man and the kid? Are they going to ever talk again? Or are they, like, where does it end with them? So it ends, uh, right, so there's the, there's this concert, uh, and the old man tries to screw him over by embarrassing him in front of all these important people in the city, right? And yes. he ends up playing the drum solo of his life and career, and they kind of, come together in that moment like like they both got what they wanted out of it and so you kind of get the impression that maybe they'll continue to have some animosity but they both respect each other a lot and have kind of gotten out of the relationship what they hope to get that old man isn't clear that this is the final test for this kid that he's trying to fucking sabotage him right yeah oh uh, yes he is not clear that it, right at this point i think he really wanted to sabotage him um, yeah, so absolutely this is getting to the immediacy and the urgency of the relationship that I was talking about, right? Which is at there is a character who sounds like he's torn between recognizing a talent and wanting to task him and put him through the uh, crucible to make that talent as well as he can, while simultaneously he's indulging the trauma of being wildly jealous of this kid and despising the fact that this kid might actually do the thing that he could never do, right? Mm -hmm by having those elements at play when these two when these two witches are together right just from one character's point of view it's immediately complicated and and i, I keep coming back to the word the urgent and immediate meaning shit shit can get tense at any fucking moment and can go in a dangerous direction at any moment because of that trauma and then the kid do you remember anything about the kid like what was wrong with the kid when he showed up you know what i'm saying or was the kid just someone who needed to go to. So that, 
they did that really well with the kids relationship with the dad it's like so the dad kind of was constantly encouraging stability right and having a backup plan and and all that and um and so he would go, the kid would go back and forth and um, and they also did this well with the girlfriend right like so he gets into band and he's really proud of himself and he starts dating this girl and then he realizes he's not good enough because of the way Fletcher's pushing him. And so he goes and breaks up with the girl and is like, we can't be together because, you know, you're going to distract me. Um, and so it's basically, he's, he's at war with the idea of mediocrity, right? Like he doesn't want stability. He doesn't want mediocrity. Um, and, and he's being he groomed that for his father. father. And he's, he's yeah. just, right. Okay. Right. But, but this is all great. Right. So in a way, he is being groomed for mediocrity by his, by his father and is sent out into a world that's going to either destroy him, right? Or harden him in the files of this, the fires of this uh, odyssey, you know, into something that could never be mediocre, right? But yeah, what you got to so- get is the desperate want, which is I want to be a great drummer, and the upbringing, and I'm gonna call that a trauma for now, which is, son, you're being trained to be mediocre. And I bet you that the writer of this movie felt like hella people he or she has seen in their life, in his, in that person, in that writer's life, could have been so much more, but we're trained to be mediocrity. We're trained to have plan Bs and to be safe or whatever, right? And so that part of what makes this movie work a lot is that this writer maybe had something to say with that character embodied something much bigger than the writer right and all of this is why we love that simple ass fucking movie you know what i'm saying so when we talk about your two characters are they there are you that clear on it you don't have to be that clear on the first one no and that's so awesome um so i think my protagonist is close um you had this woman with this backstory, right? And it's and all of that that has happened has manifested into what inside the pit of this character. So uh, she she has a need to basically carve out a life of her own. She has a need for something. She need she has a need to find her own path, right? And and that's what all of this ends up coming down to. And there's so much of this that has to do with exactly what you're talking about. So. You know, in the first act, we when she first leaves, she tries to get this apprenticeship, the witch turns her way. She goes back to this village um, and she it's kind of suggested that she should become a married woman and whatnot. Right. And she leaves and, she, and that kind of spurs her on to say, no, this isn't what I want. And then at the end of the second act, there's some more. Anyway, I'm, I'm rambling here. What what um, does it mean to your lead character if she fails? If she fails, what what does that mean to her? So if she fails, then she doesn't have a life that she wants to live. Um, she doesn't want to live a life as a quiet Catholic wife who, you know, doesn't have a say in her life and is just kind of living out the minutes. Um, and can I ask you this? Yes. It feels like what you're saying is in this time period, the subjugation of women is subhuman right man it's like it's funny like i can't seem to articulate this stuff well even though but i feel you're gonna like exercise bro you, you're you are, you're articulating it better than i am but this is this is an exercise this is what i was saying about growing right like it feels like if this is a woman who has looked out into the world and seen men doing awful fucking shit to women and then in her own life has subjugated trauma and that even the women who brutalized her did it at the service of men, right? And that, and that she knows what awaits her is a life of subjugation and torture, kind of like some Handmaiden's Tale shit, right? You know what I'm saying? And so there is a desperate need to be a human being, but what's missing that I haven't, that I can't drill down on, Nate, is the thing, the 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 piece of coal, cancer or coal that's in the core of her, because of this, 
that's going to be relinquished along the way. The thing she discovers that like you don't want her to just discover self-empowerment. You want her to destroy that thing that was of, of, of fucked upness that was nurtured in her. Right. Like, let me give you an example from a project show. Well, I always use this. It was an exercise where I had this breakthrough. Like the question I always ask people, what does it mean to your lead character if they fail? Right. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, was working with Shell on this project. Um, and the project is set in ye old times, right? And it's about a woman who uh, uh, was a prostitute and our, when, by the time it begins, has the biggest whorehouse in this area, right? And she's married to this gangster who protects her and he's big time in this area, right? And she's rich and she's running shit, right? And uh, as the story's going, competition moves in. And uh, 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 you can see that she dominates her boyfriend everything, right? Um, and that's an important detail because competition moves in, things are going on. She's, she's got, you know, she's got clout with politicians or whatever. None of that is working, right? And the more she fails at stopping this competition, this is just in the pilot, right? The more desperate she becomes to the point that it starts to get a little bit weird, right? And by the end of the pilot, she burns down the rival whorehouse, right? And her boyfriend, who she's dominated and controlled and manipulated all the time, shows up and says, oh my God, what the fuck did you do? And um, um, she says, you wouldn't stop him and the politician would have stopped. I had to fucking do something. And he beats the shit out of her, which he, you know he's never done before. And that makes you go, oh, wait, I've seen her spit on him and do whatever she wants with him. What would make him do that? And then he, after he beating her up, he said, the dude who was backing that whorehouse is the boss of my boss. And we're all going to die because of this, right? That's your hook on the pilot. Where we asked ourselves is this, this woman has money. She has success. If she got slowly worked out, she'd be fine. Why would she do this, right? What 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 does it mean to her if she fails? Like if she fails, meaning this, if this whorehouse grows and hers dies and she has failed, right? And we realized, well, what did it take? Like in this time period, bro, the shit they were doing to women, they, they had these things, I forget what they're called. It's fucked. What women had to deal with is crazy, dude. Like they had these yeah. things where like women's families would get in debt. And this is in New York City. And they would drink lie on stage and kill themselves so that their family could be paid, right? And that's a show and people would cheer and shit. It was fucked up. Women weren't treated like human beings, right? Holy shit. And so what, sh- what, what we came up with in asking why this woman would do this is think about everything that happened to turn this woman into a prostitute. Then think about that, all that trauma created this, a thing we found a term for it. I think it's called scarcity disorder or whatever, right? But basically the idea is my past was so fucking traumatic that every, anything, if I ever stop getting away from my past, that means my past in my mind and heart is going to come consume me and burn me alive. It is an active dragon that is chasing me at all times. And so as this story is playing out, that past is getting closer and closer. That trauma of what turned her into a prostitute and how women are treated around here is in her mind and in her heart is getting closer and closer and making her more irrational, right? Until she does a thing that sets the season in order. And what does it mean to this woman if she fails and she doesn't have the biggest horror house? It means that she will be consumed by something so dark and depraved inside of her, she can't put into words and she'd rather risk her own life than to let those feelings come back. You gotta be clear enough on your characters that you can say some version of whatever yours is for her and that. I agree with you. It's funny, dude, Um, like talking with you just makes me feel like such a newbie (laughs) writer. It like, happens to me all the time. And like, it and it's good, but that's all- awesome, right? Like, that's what I want. Like, I want to be challenged in that way. Um, it's it's really like, like I love this, like just the way the wheels are turning right now. It's it's really really good. 
Great. Um, flick. But yeah, I mean, that's exactly what I need to do is, is dig into those characters. All right, and those way. two words come to mind, urgency and immediacy. Yeah. Right, because for a movie like this, where the stakes of the world aren't at play and da da da, right? Everything gotta mean the most to them in a given moment. They have to laugh the hardest, fight the hardest, fuck the most, do whatever in a given moment because that's all you got. And that moment is is manifested, the, the importance of it. We did, I know we must've talked about the crown on the last time we did it. Nope. So what the crown taught me, you talk about feeling like a newbie, right? But a revelation I had of watching the crown was fuck stakes, right? We know she's gonna live because she's alive today, right? We know there's no war happening, all that shit, you know what I'm saying? And what you learn in watching The Crown is an episode will be about which attache is the queen gonna go with? The older attache who's that everyone knows or the younger one, right? Mm -hmm. And by the end of the episode, you're leaning in on your seat wondering which one she's gonna pick, right? And the crazy thing about it is that shit feels like Game of Thrones and it don't even fucking matter. But because of how important it is to the characters, what it means to them in the world he's created, tradition and rituals and rules, right? Are life and death in their minds. And so which attache she picks is the same thing of whether the Khaleesi is gonna go fucking crazy and have dragons burn down as, as far as they concern, right? And so you, and, and that brings that urgency and immediacy to those small intimate scenes she's having because who otherwise who the fuck cares? Yeah, and that kind of honestly goes back to just what you were talking about with, you know, the, the writer's only job really to be interesting, right? Like, because if you've got that urgency and immediacy then it becomes a lot easier for every single scene to have to just kind of push the story forward um, without getting boring. So if you can do that on a rewrite. It, it's funny, like when I do the things I'm talking with you about and yeah. get clear on those characters, I'll write a paragraph that gets to that for the lead characters sometimes and throw away my outline and just because uh, I've done the outline already and just write the script based on those paragraphs because hmm. i know this is what matters not them fucking beats not that structure this is what matters what does it mean so you do a whole character? outline and then you'll write just like the moment where all well, of that I'll is clear distill, and you build out from that i'll distill these characters down to what the fuck is supremely oh i misunderstood you okay me, right and what is supremely compelling about this character to me and whatever right and I might write a paragraph of why their journey is compelling and why their relationship is compelling, but it's all rooted in those characters and that core thing so that the, the beats I wrote, I don't have to look at no more because I kind of have them memorized, but this is what matters. This is what makes what at this, whether the fucking bomb is gonna go off or whether you can pick the older, younger attache, that's this is what matters. You know what I'm saying? Listen, if Ethan, if Ethan Hunt, the dude from Mission Impossible, didn't give a fuck if anyone died, he'd be like, I don't know, man. The, you know the wires. I'm gonna just pull this red wire, and it's gonna go. And who cares? But in his DNA, they've constructed a character who kind of have sacrificed his whole life so that he can save lives. Right. Yeah. This is everything to him. And it's a little bit of a cheat because the bomb, you know, there's a bomb, but. It works. Uh, dude, uh, I don't know. You give me a lot to think about. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's it's really, it's super on point. I think like I, I could just tell like this is the stuff that I need to focus on to be a better writer and to be the type of writer that I want to be. So yeah. that's yeah. that's super cool, man. Oh, actually, I do have one quick thing. Um, so uh, somebody who had watched your last episode that you did with me um, was wondering, because you were talking about the importance of passion and everything, right? Um, and how you need to have passion in whatever it is that you're doing um, to, to carry you through it. And they were wondering, you know, how do you apply that to uh, an assignment and specifically some like major IP like Marvel? You know, like 
how does that, how, how do you apply that same level of passion to that? So it, there's different versions of it, right? There's been times where I've been hired to rewrite and there isn't a ton of passion there, but what there is, is sometimes it's like seeing the matrix. You'll pick up a script and be like, fuck, I know how to make this work, right? And that's not necessarily writing for passion, but you just, because the first writer or first couple writers have made some mistakes and gotten some things right, right? What they've left you is, oh fuck, I can dust this off and dust that off, move that here, do this, whatever, and I can make this work. And that's a great place to write from. Clarity is not the same as passion, but it's a great, great place to write from, right? Um, for a major Marvel IP, you know, um, um, in that thing where there's not that script there before you, like on assignment or whatever, right? Yeah. I won't do an assignment if I don't have clarity or don't have passion. I can't get into the details of the Marvel thing, but the take was all rooted in stuff that I felt strongly about. Nice. Even though Marvel very much, you know, is a part of the creative process. They're smart. They're like this. Well, I know this dude loves this element. We're going to keep this alive. And then, you know, they agreed on it, whatever, right? But the truth is, I wouldn't have did the Marvel. There's no way I would have did it if it would have had to have been what I knew I could wake up and die for every day or I'm not doing it. And, I've, and, I'm, and I don't want to sound like I got hella integrity or nothing. I've tried it the other way before. And the shit just, the worst is when it does work because that's a bad lesson but it doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for me. I don't want to do it. I don't like the feeling of it. I don't, I, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I can wake up every day with clarity and be like, fuck, I know, let me dedicate, you know, hours to this thing and it's going to get better and it's going to deliver them something that we agreed upon. That's the clarity version. Or I can wake up every day and be like, I can't fucking wait to write this shit, even if it's scaring me or breaking my heart or feeling like I've lost control over it. But I, 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 otherwise, I can't. And and so to the to the to the person who commented, I think it's a way you when you get the IP, be fucking honest with yourself, right? Are you really passionate? Do you love this IP? That's not the same as being passionate about what you're about to write, right? I fucking love Marvel stuff, right? But that doesn't mm -hmm. mean I can write every single Marvel movie, right? Be honest with the story you want to tell. Don't pander. And go in there and tell the story that you can be passionate about and know that when you do that, a lot of times you're not gonna make the second round, right? The more vague or traditional you are, it's gonna increase your odds of advancing, but it's gonna increase your odds of getting beat out by someone who wants it, more, who, who feels more strongly of it. But let me try and make this clear. Oh, fuck, Marvel, who don't wanna work there? There's very few people in America that weren't affected by them comics, as far as I know. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Yeah. And 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 so there is passion for the space, but the story you're gonna tell. If you start to think, eh, I think there was a better story there, you know, let's be real here, depending on where you at in your career, you know what I'm saying? You might you might just go with the flow. But the ideal version is you say, no, 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 no. Let me rotate this. This dynamic, let's think of something we've all seen. Uh, uh, event, the last two Avengers movies, Endgame and uh, Infinity War, right? Sure. Let's say, you, let's say someone was coming in to pitch on uh, uh, Endgame, right? You know what's got to happen, right? And but let's say the writer went like this. You know what, though, y'all? I fucking seen these other heroes before. I know where they're at. I know how they feel about this story. I want to fucking tell the story of Thanos, which is what happened, right? Yeah. They really focus on Thanos, right? Totally. Wait, what? The bad guy? Nah, what about the heroes? Don't worry, we're going to service those heroes, but this is Thanos' story, right? That can get you booted out, right? But that can also get you that movie and get you that job. So Got that's it. what you do. You rotate the IP, you rotate it and find a dimension of it that you feel strongly about and it's super specific. And again, specificity People butt against that shit a lot of times, but but when they don't, then you're like this with, with your partners. That's a good answer. All right, man.
No, thank you, man. I appreciate it. It's going to um, be weird to try and edit this one together with all my uh, rambling and everything. But uh, dude, uh, thank you so much for challenging me like that. I'm, I'm really excited to take this forward. So Always a pleasure, Mac. Yeah. Um, man. Um, boost my views, man. Pay some money and buy some bots to boost the views on my... All right. Will do. All right. Later, man. That was so awesome. So many things from that are going to stick with me, including everything that he said about trauma and immediacy and urgency and that question that he asked, what happens if they fail? That was a huge help in helping me craft the end of my second act. And it's just got so much more emotional punch than it would have had if we hadn't had that conversation. And now I'm on page 80, which is so exciting. It means that uh, Fade Out is right around the corner and... It also means that I've got a little bit of extra time built in to go back and spruce them things up before I send it to my first round of readers, which is just great. As with the last three weeks, if you're doing this along with me, action steps for week 12 are pretty simple. Read a script and write 20 to 25 pages of your first draft. That will put you within striking distance of fade out by the end of next week. Like every week, I'm giving away an autographed copy of Mouse and Mistletoe signed by myself and by Jack Purcell. Uh, Malcolm just mentioned one of the best screenwriting resources that he's read, and I put a link for that in the show notes below. I think it'd be super cool if the comment section on this particular video just becomes a running list of great screenwriting resources. So if you want to comment below the link to a screenwriting resource that has helped you out, I will pick one of you and send a copy of Malice and Mistletoe your way. So uh, that's it for week 12, everyone. Thank you so much for checking this out. Up next week, I've got Charlie and Vlaz Parlopanides coming up. They are just coming off of their hit Blood of Zeus. If you haven't seen that on Netflix yet, definitely check that out. It is eight episodes of Greek mythological spectacle, and it is just awesome. So make sure you check that out. Make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss it. And uh, hopefully I'll be hitting fade out next week or, uh, you know, smash cut to black. <laughs>